an arrest in a nearly four decade old cold case thanks to cutting edge DNA technology. The arrest happening exactly 39 years to the day when Parabon Nano Labs used that sample to create 3D models of the suspected killer's face. It's heartbreaking. We miss her and we're going to find her. We're going to keep looking until we do. It's like a never ending nightmare. It doesn't end. It keeps returning and it coming back. So I guess I've got to hit the uh, next one at one instead of just after it clicks to one. <laughs> yeah, I was just a little bit of a, a bit pause there. <laughs> all of a sudden we were there. Oops. <laughs> so we've got uh, eight people in so far. Well, that's not bad. It's a pretty good little start. Welcome everybody for, for watching. Welcome, Tammy. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to do a quick intro. Uh, we got we're over, we're double digits, so it's okay to do the intro now, right? <laughs> yeah. So tonight we talked. We are talking to Tammy Menier Pease. Is it Menier Pease? Whichever you prefer, Menier Pease is good. Is that the French uh, version? Yes. <laughs> um, she's the daughter of Geraldine Towers, one of the victims of serial killer James Hicks. Tammy, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank and you. Look at that first comment. Oh, Garrison. I met Garrison. She says, love you, Mom. Thanks, Garrison. Um, so we sh I should just, for uh, transparency reasons, and I don't know, because I really like you, uh, I should say that Tammy and I have known each other for quite a few years now. I think eight or, eight or ten years, anyway. Yeah. I'll probably Definitely more than that. Yeah. We're getting old. Yeah. Um, so we used to work together, and... We talked about your mom's case a couple times. It's funny because I think I knew you a year or two before I knew that uh, your mom was a victim, you know, and, and had been murdered. So, you know, I've talked about it several times, start trying to get it on here and covered. So I'm so excited that we're able to finally do that tonight. Yes, definitely. So if you wouldn't mind kind of uh, telling us about your mom, um, what you remember of her, and uh, then kind of lead up to the days of before the disappearance and uh, everything that happened uh so my mom i was 12 when my mom um disappeared and what i know of her was pretty um it was a chaotic life um, a lot of alcoholism dysfunction in the family we moved a lot um but she was she was a good person um she did the best she could with what uh she had to work with i guess or what she grew up in herself. Um, so like I said, we moved a lot and, um, we had a, some good times and there were a lot of, um, difficult times as well. Um, I wasn't in the home when she disappeared. As far as living in the home, I was staying with my dad, uh, brother of mine were, um, living with my dad in St. Albans and my mother asked for us to visit um, one weekend, October 16th of, um, 82. And we went there, we spent the day, then we went bowling, um, in Pittsfield at the bowling alley. And after some bowling, um, it was a difficult time there because that was my safe place, the bowling alley where people didn't know what my childhood was like. Um, that was the place I went with my dad, um, not my mom. And so I bowled a lot and my mother being an alcoholic was in the bar drinking and she had spent the money that um, was for our bowling. So she couldn't pay for our bowling. And uh, cool. she sent my uh, step, her stepfather back to Newport to get a jar of money um, and bring it back and had us kids, my brother, two brothers and I um, to roll the money in front of people. So that was, I was angry. It wasn't a good, it wasn't a good time. It was very embarrassing, humiliating. Um, I, can, but again, I can imagine being yeah. 12 years old, like, yeah. you know, that's the age where kids start thinking they're all cool. And then, well, in <laughs> that was my place where I was, um, people knew me as like a really good bowler. I, that's what people knew about me. That's pretty much all they knew about my life. Kind of, mm -hmm. um, and so to see that and have people understand that there was another part of my life, you know, was hard. And being 12, that's, mm. that's good. 
so then we finally left the bowling alley and I can remember I was so angry and my mother wanted to stop at the Gateway Lounge, which is now, I think China Way is what it's called in Newport. Um, it was a Gateway Lounge at that time and she wanted to stop and um, go to the bar and have some drinks. Oh, and I was so angry and I remember I can, I can still see her when she got out of the vehicle and she turned and she waved and said, you know, goodbye. And all I could think underneath was, and what I said to myself was, I hope you die. And being 12, you know, you say things, you think things, because you're angry. Right. So that's hard. I, had, I lived with that for quite some time. Um, you know, that that feeling of guilt. Um, then she went into the, the bar and we went to her house. She shared like a little cottage in Newport with her mom and stepdad. And she had... Uh, half of the house where she lived with my brother, um, one of my brothers. And um, my other brother and I were just visiting that night. So um, we went back there, we kind of hung out and then we went to bed. She was supposed to call that night to my stepdad, um, her stepdad and just say, you know, I need to ride home, I'm ready to come home. So, and that call never came. So, mm. but a, so um, Go ahead. So when did you realize that she was uh, missing? Was it well, the next morning? The next morning, um, my, her stepdad had been sitting up and he had seen a set of headlights pull into the driveway and he just, he assumed that she had gotten a ride home. And so he went to bed. And when I woke up that next morning, when we went to, well, go back a little bit. When we went to bed that night, it's like, that section of the house, there were really no walls that separated anything. It was like a little cottage. So I was sleeping in her bedroom, but you could see into the living room. You could see into the kitchen. And that's pretty much all there was there. And all the lights were on. I can remember my brothers had the music banging and like it was loud. And um, when I woke up that morning, you know, and she wasn't there, it really wasn't shocking. Um, in the past, um, growing up, there have been times when she just didn't come home. You know, but um, she she would call at some point and say where she was or when she'd be home. But it really wasn't that strange. And I remember saying um, there was a man standing over my bed last night. I remember seeing a man standing over my bed and everybody's like, oh, you were just dreaming it. It didn't happen. Whatever. No, it, it did happen. I remember. Um, so basically, then they ended up calling um, the police because she they couldn't, you know, they didn't know where she was and it kind of went from there. Um, and I went back home, my brother and I went back home with my dad in St. Albans. And um, so that was, that was what happened that night there. And like I so said, we weren't living there. What so. was the initial thoughts um, like that morning? Were you worried at all about her or did you just think, okay, she's out partying, doing something? Yeah, not worried at all. Um, you know, and, and it's hard because, um, I, I don't want to, people to think, oh, you don't care and you don't, um, didn't care or whatever, but you had to understand the life that we were living at that time was she had left for a week before and with someone. And so, but she always came back. Um, but she, the kids were left, you know, my brothers and I were left alone sometimes. So. Yeah. Um, not it wasn't strange to us or me right, right. How, so, how old are your brothers or how old were your brothers at this time um i think the next one uh would be about three years older than me maybe a couple years and my oldest brother was getting ready to graduate i believe so he would have been about 18 so he was, you're but, the youngest yes um he lived there with um my mother so we all have different fathers. Um, we do have another brother that was adopted by um, my mother's sister and raised as our cousin. So that kind of can tell you the dysfunction in the family. And um, yeah, it was a little, little rough, huh? Yeah, it was, it was. I'm not sure I thought it was real rough. I think that was kind of. No. I knew it wasn't normal, but not function to the extent that when you look back like wow that was yeah 
Mm. Love the film. So, so, yeah. All right. So the next day, uh, who did they contact? State police or Newport? No, they did Newport police. Chief Parker. Um, so, and again, you have to remember, um, my mother was an alcoholic. She was poor, um, you know, welfare. Um, there wasn't really a lot of like surprise or, or, or a lot of um, quickness to go find her, I guess you should say. Um, they looked into it. Um, but that was about it. My grandmother had to really push, I think, for them to so really do anything. Was she kind of well known to them? They was like, okay, this is, you know, just. <laughs> Well known to the police. Um, my mother didn't don't really think she had a criminal history um, at all, really. Maybe an OUI or something, but nothing major that she would have attracted the attention of law enforcement. But, you know, when they asked about what her norm was, what, you know, what's normal, what's not normal, you know, and then they find out she was at a bar, she was now call it, that sort of thing. I think, you know, oh, she just took off, they think. And right. she'll be back. So it wasn't given the attention probably that it might probably would have been today. Definitely, you know, and um, so it took a little longer, but they did. Um, the chief went to Hicks house um, eventually, you know, within a few days and um, talked to him about it because the bartender um, said, I was that, ask you, how did they find uh, Hicks? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so he was well known in the community, you know, at the bar and, uh, he was living in Etna or Carmel at the time. I can't remember when he was at that time. But so then um, they talked to the bartender and anybody was there. And she, and the bartender, I think her name was Judy, said, "Well, we don't, you know, I, I guess I remember seeing her, but I don't remember seeing her leave with anybody, that sort of thing." And then she remembered Hicks, James Hicks was there, and that they may have walked out the door together. And yes, that they, she recalled finally that they had been in a corner drinking together. He had bought her, purchased her drinks. So, all night long. So, um, but my mother did not get into his vehicle. He offered her a ride. Um, he, she denied it, which he says she denied it, which is kind of strange. But, anyways, and he said that he went headed towards home and he needed gas. So he went back to floods in Newport, which is now, I don't know if it's still floods or not. Um, it's on route seven, that big store there on the left. And, um, he said that he pumped his gas and he saw my mother coming out of the store, asked her if she wanted to ride. She accepted. And he doesn't say that they went back to the house, but they did. They did go back to the house. You have to understand he's not, Tell him the truth about everything. So um, he he thinks he's winning when he keeps a little bit of it to himself. You know, like oh, you know, I I did this, but I'm not going to tell him that. So right. you know, weird. Yeah. So he says they mm -hmm. went to the um, lake um, where the boat landing was in Newport, and for whatever reason, he said he got into the back seat um, and. He just, she was dead and she was in the front seat and he said that he doesn't know what happened. He strangled her um, with his hands. He believes his hands. Um, and then he said he moved her into the back seat. My mother wasn't a small person. She had just been released from the hospital and with severe alcoholism, her, her um, kidneys and liver were failing due to the alcoholism. And so she was very bloated at that time and she was well over 200 pounds um so he's not a big man either he's five six maybe and um was like 170 ish pounds maybe so mm. and to move her so that's just odd to me but to move her from the front seat to the back seat must have taken quite a bit um you know dead weight and that and i'm not saying that to be funny i'm saying definitely dead weight you know and um so, and then they supposedly left there and he drove home where his so, firm was. So to backtrack, when the police officer first interviewed James, first of all, they didn't think that, you know, they thought your mom had, had 
run off or whatever, right? And that was the story they that he told them was that she had run away with some truck driver and uh, no, that was Florida. That was his wife. He said, "Oh, I'm that. sorry. See, I just screwed that up. Oh my gosh. There's sorry. a lot, so much to it. It's been honestly. a long day. I started my day at three this morning. <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's so much to it. It's, 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 so when they talked to him, they didn't even realize his wife had been missing. So he's like, "You're here to he, uh, I'm talking. Brought you. her up. I'm sorry. So yeah, so he, he brought, brought her up. up. Yeah. Um, Chief Rick had no idea, and he's he's starting to get all like." um crazy acting and he dumped a bottle of water over his head and he's acting strange and he's like you're here you think i killed my my wife and which was in 1977 i believe mrs 82 and ricker's like what <laughs> no i'm here to talk about Geraldine towers and um actually what they found out was my mom was in the trunk when the um police officer when the he wasn't no she, kidding yeah so he was um he was in the trunk and uh, she was in the trunk and they didn't have a search warrant they would just say they talk to him you know and so yeah how crazy do you is know that? if they do you know if they asked if they could look around at all or no i don't think to... they just asked him you know he, he acted strange and what happened was his girlfriend her name was linda marquis um and she just told them to get off the property and leave so they did and then they're like okay something strange here this doesn't seem right. right, you know? And so then my mother's case kind of went to a standstill because there was nothing more, you know, nobody had come in and said they'd seen anything. Um, and so that kind of took the back burner to his wife's disappearance. And they went on to work on that. And um, so they did that. And in 1983, I remember I was in an upward bound program at the university of maine because i was in high school i spent the summer there and he was brought up on charges and he was the first man first case in maine to be brought up on murder charges fourth degree murder i believe without a body right so and he was convicted and he was yeah they were successful so that was definitely the they first. were because the babysitter saw his wife dead that she assumed was dead on the on the couch when she walked in yeah can you uh, tell us that story uh so she come home so uh, um jenny hicks was a uh, from everything i you know learned that very nice woman um you know loved her family loved her kids um it was a toxic relationship um hicks was very abusive that sort of thing um so she uh, a susan mattingly i think her name was was the babysitter and she was a foster care for out of massachusetts and she ended up moving in somehow with them with Hicks and his wife and took care of the kids. So Hicks started to hit on Susan, you know, like sexual um, uh, touching or that sort of thing. And she told Jenny and Jenny had had enough at that point. And she confronted him. She told Susan um, to go out that night with her boyfriend and she was gonna talk to Jimmy is what she called him. And so, she did that and when she came home about 4 a.m um james hicks was sitting in front of a tv with just static playing and jenny was on the sofa but in a very weird position like not like she was laying there herself like somebody had put her there her hair was down over her face you couldn't see her face her arms were in an awkward position so he said oh jenny sleeping go to bed she did and she heard like somebody dragging something across the floor um that sort of thing and then she was scared of him herself. And then she woke up and Jenny was gone, but her wallet, her glasses, and she was pretty, um, had a, a vision problem. So she could not have gone anywhere without her glasses. And her purse was still there. He said she left and she left with a crocker, blah, blah, blah. And um, so that's how that went. And nobody really looked into it. Um, an officer it was it wasn't handled properly um like a sheriff's department person came and talked to him when jenny's family um contacted them and he said oh she left with a trucker so the kids stayed with him and um yeah so that's that kind of he just kept saying she called and she he's heard from her people have seen her that sort of thing but nobody had ever seen her only him you know so he just went on with his life and raising his kids and he was abusive to them 
and unfortunately, and they lived a very, very tough life. Actually, I went to school with one of his children when my mother was missing. It was very wow. awkward. It was awkward. So, you know, because she knew that people thought her dad had killed my mother. My mother's yeah. been found. Did, did you guys ever talk about it? Never. Never. No. People ask yeah, why. That's... I felt for her. I really felt bad for her. Um, I had no nothing, no anger towards her um, at all. You know, so. How, how long after your, your mother went missing did this happen? Did. This before. Oh, oh, this was the way. Oh, right, right. That, sorry. Was, yeah. 77. And that was, yeah, 77 and 82, right? Okay. Just like so many, you know, the way it went, it was kind of all around <laughs> to get to the end of everything. So, um, so then he was convicted of uh, her fourth degree mur murder, I believe. He was sentenced to 10 years at Thomaston uh, at the time, and he only served eight because of good behavior. So yeah, he, he had them all fooled, right? Like fourth degree you know, murders, you know, slaughter charge. I think. Yeah, it's funny because he he wasn't a troublemaker. He always went to work. All of that. He he, you know, other than some weird stuff that he had an anger issue. There really wasn't like anything that said, "Oh, this man's a serial killer," you know. So they um. He gets out and um, he's with, uh, I think, uh, Linda Marquis still. She, oh, she marries him while he's in prison. Linda did. That was the girl that told the police to leave that day. And then I have an uncle that um, got involved, um, Vance Tibbetts, who has now passed away. But he, my uncle did, um, I think, quite a few years at Thomaston himself. So when Hicks was in Thomaston for killing his wife, um, they let um, my uncle meet with um, James Hicks in a room privately. So my uncle was known as um, pretty much rough and tough, you know. And so he said, you killed my sister. And Hicks said, no, I didn't. And he said, yes, you did. And I don't know. It kind of went like that. And, and then he gets out of prison. My uncle starts stalking him, basically. And... Um, then as I got a little bit older, probably about 18, 19, I started stalking him. So, um, so <laughs> yeah, I would drive by and um, pull into his driveway. It was just, I lived near him later, you know, early 20s. And I would pull in. I remember the night I got stuck kind of in his driveway. It was a winter night and I was like, oh. yeah, but I got out. So, how, and then. How did you get out? Did he come out and help you get out or? Oh, thankfully, I, I lost story. And got out. Oh. But, um, and I did. Yeah, that must have been a panic inducing couple minutes there. A little. Um, he hated me. He would send um, messages like he would tell his his uh, daughter, uh, I don't know if it was his niece or whatever, to give me messages at school um, that, you know, he would kill me, he would do this, he would do that. And so he would threaten. Um, wow. And then I uh, started going to this road to the left of his house where I'm, I knew my mother was. I just knew she was buried there. And I would go out back in the woods. My aunt went out with me once as well. Um, there was a lot of like old, back in the day, people threw bottles and garbage, just threw it out in the back, you know, in the woods. And there was a lot of bottles and stuff out there. And I just started digging, started moving things. I went out there multiple times. Um, I knew she was there. I knew maybe probably a hundred yards, maybe um, from where she was actually buried. So, um, and then one time the medical examiner, I think it was a medical examiner. They went out to take a cadaver dog out to his property to sniff around, see if they could find anything. And it didn't, the dog didn't hit on anything and they left and come to find out the um, uh, medical examiner's examiner's vehicle and some state police were parked right over where my mother was to park, yeah, so they parked over where the dog the oh area. man i remember him coming at the courthouse and apologizing to her for that not his fault not his fault no. so yeah um do you want me to keep going or tell you how it well just real quick i mean it's interesting because i know your last 
conversation with your mother wasn't the best, probably, or, or your last thoughts at least. And yet uh, you felt the need to find her, right? Bring her justice. And it was a strange uh, relationship, you know, when you, no matter, I think what your parents do sometimes and sometimes an abusive, she didn't, I don't think she wanted to be abusive, but put us in necessarily into dangerous places or things that happened a lot that happened that was very um it was very abusive um not even necessarily just at her hands or um that sort of thing um but the situation she put us in was dangerous right. and the people around us but i still she was still my mother you know and you'll hear a lot of kids who are abused say that say you know no matter what they were still your parent they're still my parent and mm -hmm. and so I did, um, as I grew, I was very angry with her, but I also was, I learned to understand that the life she lived as a child was much like what I was living as a child. So sometimes you, you live what you know, or she mm -hmm. tried to, um, be, she tried to overcome alcoholism and she would go to the Seton rehab and would have terrible Tuesday where you go in and you tell, you sit in a circle and you tell her how bad she is as an alcoholic, knowing you're going home at some point with her. So that was never fun. So that was <laughs> multiple times. And uh, so she tried to um, be sober. And then as soon as she left rehab, there were people right there to hand her her drink back again. So <coughs> Jeez. my mother found love and self-worth in a man that's that's where she she found herself and and so there was a lot of men in and out of the house um she just wanted to be loved i think so yeah. uh we do have a comment here ronda uh, i'm sorry randa thibodeau uh, you broke the cycle through uh oh my gosh can't that's read my daughter you broke the cycle though with, oh, with your own children for that's grateful for my amazing mother yeah that's sweet. Yep. So, so her name's, is it Randa? Randa, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Randa. I Thanks, Randa. I wanted to call you Randa. <laughs> yep. Um, and I did try to do that, definitely. Um, so I guess that's why I, she was still a human being. She didn't deserve what he did to her. Um, nobody does, you know. And, yeah. So, and, and Go, ahead. I to go back to something you mentioned earlier you said that you know they might have handled things differently today and unfortunately we do still see situations like this where someone might have a substance abuse issue or the mental health and it it's not necessarily uh handled appropriately it's not looked into as probably quickly as as they would have uh other cases um i agree not to be I all doom and gloom but they they, they do still it, it, things are not necessarily a whole lot better when it comes to attention for cases like this oh, definitely um i think it some people get a little more attention now and but you're right it if you have a substance abuse issue or or things like that um i think you're looked down upon and sometimes not considered as an important case as some so yeah so so matt is like Read my mind because that's gonna be my next question. Yeah, we're about, about ready to get onto that. So, so what makes him a serial killer? Um, so, Jenny uh, Sear Hicks, yep. your mom. Yep. Uh, and there Matt. was a woman. At, they still hadn't found my mom's body. They hadn't found Jenny's body. Um, and uh, James Hicks decided to date again another woman, very independent woman who had worked at, um, she'd been in the military, not his type at all. He likes women that he can control. And uh, he met her while working at the Brewer Motorman, I think it's called. And he ended up moving in with her. Um, she was struggling with some stuff. She had lost a pet, um, just some depression, things like that. He was very um, controlling and, and stuff. Um, so finally she wanted out of the relationship and he killed her and he strangled her and the go of course the police it, by this time you know all these women keep coming up missing so he's on the radar he's being followed the state police are following him um 
the police have gone to the FBI. He, they labeled him. They said definitely a serial killer, um, even though they hadn't found any bodies. Um, so he, when the police went to, he's got to be the luckiest man. It's really um, the police went to investigate her disappearance because she just disappeared. She had planned on moving out. She had already moved some um, some things and took her dog to her sister's to Wendy's house and. So the police came and asked, um, Jimmy, where's Lynn? Name is Lynn Willette. And he's like, oh, she took off, took off. Everybody takes off. Nobody ever sees them again. Um, fortunately, she was in the closet dead. So once again, wow. you know, of course, they didn't have a search warrant. They didn't have anything. They could not look. So, Jesus. yeah, it's crazy. And so uh, then time goes by and he, he start seeing this girl named Brandy. She's like 18 or so, and he's 40 years old. So, and she gets pregnant, DHS steps in, takes the child. Um, she has another child, DHS steps in, takes the child because of him, because of all, you know, things that the missing women, all of those things. My uncle, what, what year was this? Um, Lynn was disappeared in, see, my mother was 82. I'm thinking, oh gosh, I can't remember her the date for Lynn. Um, but it wasn't uh too much longer, I don't think. It was it was maybe five to ten years, something okay. like maybe five years. Um so still, still in the eighties. Uh, I think it was she was still in the eighties. It might have been the nineties, I'm sorry. It was no, so many that's fine, that's fine. Sorry to sidetrack, I just okay, no, no problem. And so he got tired of VHS and everybody following him and, and interfering with his life. So they go to Texas, Leveland, Texas, and they figure they can maybe have another kid. Nobody would follow them because she was pregnant again. And he starts doing, um, so Lynn is missing. Nobody finds her. Nobody, the family knows he killed her. Um, and he's just a smooth, charming you know, he can convince people, some people, I mean, everybody pretty much knew what he did, um, just couldn't prove it, couldn't find a body. So he goes to level in Texas and he starts doing, it was really like a 70, 67 year old woman that takes down this serial killer. Her name was June Moss. He starts doing some, um, you know, handyman work for her painting, that sort of thing. And um, he's, he's working for, her, and he worked for her for a few months and, uh, he was, he did good work. He showed up and everything. And then one day he just like snapped and he showed up and she, he, she had written him a check. He went to the bank to cash it for $425. The bank said the account was closed or something. She had to go into the bank and she wrote another check. He took the cash. He bought the materials. He backed up to her house to unload. She comes out. Um, of course, she's 67 years old, sweet woman. Um, he has a beer. And she, he said, do you mind if I have a beer? And she said, I, yes, I don't want you drinking in my house. And he says, well, I'm going to I'm gonna get some work done and I'll put the beer out here, leave the beer out here. So all of a sudden, he just changes his demeanor. He's always been nice to her, quiet, she said. And he comes in with his gun. And, he, and she's in a chair and he says, he says, I... I killed my wife in Maine and I did time for it and I need to get out of here. And, and he makes her drink this cough syrup, a bottle of cough syrup. Well, it's in a, you know, she's like, is that poison? And he takes a swig off it and he's like, no, see, it's not poison. It's cough syrup. She's like, oh, I don't want to drink it. And he forces her to drink it. And she does. And then she vomits a few times and He's still kind of ranting and raving. Do you have guns in, in the house that I can take? Do you, um, I need you to sign over your vehicle to me. And he made her write these notes to her family, everything, saying that she was lonely, she, nobody would take care of her. And she signed the letters to her family, he made her write it twice, as in her full name, June E. Moss. Like, you would never write that to your kids. It was her way of telling her kids if they ever found it that she didn't write that. You know, she was under duress. Mm -hmm. Ever. Yeah, that's very yeah. smart in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. She really found. It's the only way we found my mother was because of this woman and and the other two women. And so he's um starts running the bath water and she's in the chair and she's trying to figure out how she can get out of this house because he locked out all the doors. Da, da, da. 
but she hears him in the back and she hears this um, wind chime moving. And that's where the, she had a, like a wind chime hanging in this closet. She knew that's where the guns were and that she had showed him that. She knew he was so far back that she got up and she unlocked the doors and she got out and she ran to the neighbor. And so oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Isn't that, um, she ran in and, and one of the neighbor's kids, grandson, whatever, you know, like a teenager, young adult was there and she ran inside and they actually went out and followed him. Um, two people followed him, two men in a vehicle and they saw him throw some stuff in a dumpster and they called the police and the police arrested him. Well, he's charged with some aggravated assault on her, that sort of thing. They take him to jail. He knows he's going to do Texas is pretty serious about crime. So you, mm -hmm. you come in Texas, you get some pretty severe punishment, especially against an elderly person. And yeah. he knew he didn't like that prison, that jail. He was going crazy in there. He did not like Hispanics. He did not like black people. And in Texas, there are a lot of, you know, black people, there are Hispanics, there's multiple, you know, um, white people, that sort of thing. And he was so upset about that. He knew he wasn't going to do well there. So his plan was to came up with a plan to reach out to a detective Zamboni who had kind of had been doing a lot of the, um, you know, staying in touch with Hicks and like, he's kind of not his friend, but you know, he was like, Hey Jimmy, how's it going? You know, and that sort of thing. And let's talk. And so James Hicks um, reached out to Zamboni, detective Zamboni and said, um, I'll show you where all the bodies are and admit to everything if you let me do my time in Maine, because Maine was easy for him, you know? And so anyways, that's how that went. It, it took months, but he got back to Maine and he um, did his time in Maine uh, or, you know, wanted to do his time in Maine. So he brought, came back and he, he took them to all the locations of where all the bodies were. And wow. they were all pretty much in different places. Um, Lynn was, and this is going to be just a um a warning or whatever trigger warning um what he did to these victims after he killed them um is pretty disgusting and so for lynn willette he had taken her he had um dismembered all of his victims um my mother he had i'll tell you what he did with i'll start with his wife so what he did with her was he strangled her he Put her in his vehicle he took went out on the airline road near, towards callus and after a few days and he dismembered her and he put her head in a cooler with concrete and he disposed of her the, the remaining parts body parts um throughout like um different towns and but he kept her her head in a cooler kept it for probably least 20 something years carried around oh with him. my in word in the back of his truck the worst part was he had it at the table and made his children sit and eat breakfast and stuff and her head was in the cooler and they did not oh, know no that. terrible and with my mother he um he had put her in the trunk he had actually gone to work the next day and he had um gone through he did work at like mills. So they always check your vehicle, like the trunks and stuff. She was in the trunk. They never once checked it that day. I mean, it's like this guy just kept getting away with, you know, slipping through the cracks, I guess. And anyways, what he did with my mother, he had strangled her and he moved her down with a wheelbarrow down back where I had actually started digging. He left her there for two weeks. This was in October. After two weeks, I can't even fathom going down there and dismembering someone. And when he admitted to these crimes on, I have the actual cassette tapes of his confession. He referred to my mother as Jolene. He didn't even know her name. He didn't care. Jolene, that's what he would call her. And mm. uh, he would talk about um, dismembering them like, like you would talk about with your friend about going somewhere, you know, just some casual conversation. And with now my the, mother, go ahead. The image on the screen is where they found your mom, right? Yes. So, um, 
with that, um, they would tell us that they had found, he had told them about the remains. I found out 15 minutes before it was announced that he was coming back to Maine and he had, he said he would um, disclose where the remains were. I had 15 minutes before the TV came on to tell. Wow. So it was talking, it was like 18 years after she had disappeared. So uh, it was a long time. And then all of a sudden, bam, this happens. And so we kind of had to figure out where they were going. And I had a feeling they would be at that location. So that's where I went that morning that I knew that they were going to be looking, you know, for the remains. And sure enough, they were there. And I remember standing out there all day with binoculars and with family members and stuff and um, just waiting. Um, and so my mother was buried under a um, pig pen. It was a, bu a building at the time and then it had fallen down and been removed, but she was buried there, not far down. He had dismembered her, but he had kept her remains all together. I'm not sure why. And she still had her socks and her Dexter shoes on when they found, when they dug her up and her lucky penny that was in her shoe that obviously wasn't so lucky. But um, anyways, she had her mother's ring still on, um, you know, the skeletal remains. And then Jenny, they found did her they, head. Did they mm -hmm. say how your mom died? Yeah. He's strangulation. He, he, oh, he told him. Right. That's right. Yep. Yep. And the bone, I think they can tell by a bone in your neck. So all yeah. of the pieces were there. Um, and Jenny, they, the only thing they found of Jenny, his wife, was her head encased in um, the concrete. And he buried it under an apple tree finally after like, I don't know, decades, I guess. Um, Jeez. Okay. Yeah, and then Lynn was um, kind of all over the place. It's so sad. Um, he took her in Holton and he put her head in a um, cooler with cement and he left oh, two buckets, actually, two buckets, I think, and left them in a where they take the salt and dirt from when they um, sand and stuff during the winter. He had found oh, this like place. A town garage. The, yeah. Pit. The Haynesville Woods up in that area. You know, tombstone every mile. He, um, yep, he he did put her head there, and I think her arms. And then there was he took her the remaining body parts and um, scattered them in a different area, like coastal, I think, somewhere. He, they found he took them all around and and found these remains. And um, I remember we knew instantly when they when they located them because they put the blue. Um, awning up over the so they could start sifting and removing it was a long process and um and had so, she been um strangled as well who um yeah. all of them had been strangled that's what's what, um, so that's his mo right strangulation uh, and then dismemberment yeah can you still see me yeah yeah all right i'm just gonna turn my um said um auto like my battery sorry um battery saver thing on but anyways um can you see me now yep okay yeah yeah <laughs> all right i wasn't good there we go so um yeah so they found them and then they took the remains to the um um medical examiner's office and he did all that i remember my brother broke down um and he took off from the scene so fast that he got into an accident right there oh and, man uh, oh wow yeah. It was sad. Wow. He's a quiet guy and um, he didn't know his dad. Now his mom, he loved his mom. And um, that was hard. That was hard. So I don't see my brothers much. Um, one of them, I stay in contact, you know, like every couple of years or something. Might talk to him or that sort of thing on Facebook. But other than that, we don't, I don't have any, um, real communication with any family members at all so um you know like well, that my mother's yeah right yeah, yeah. What, what what was what was that like when uh when you guys when you finally knew that like they had him and and that they that you were able to find out where your mother was i think that for me i can tell you what it was for me um that was harder than not knowing for 18 years and mm -hmm. i'll tell you why People don't understand that um, 
when things like this happen, you still like the news. Don Colson would do a story about my mother and about the other women every year, every year, just to keep it in the news, keep it, you know. And so it was always people would talk about it with me. People would ask me questions, that sort of thing. So it's almost like it's still getting the attention. And then all of a sudden, at, when he's sentenced and all, it all comes to an end, everybody goes about their life. It's kind of like when someone is murdered and the, the news is like all about it and you don't have time to really think about it. And then all of a sudden it's done, it's gone. So mm -hmm. you're expected to go on with your life. Everybody else goes on with your life and you're like, you're left here wondering like, now what? You know, I, right. it's hard to explain, um, but that was harder for me than her missing. And I guess right. it's hard for me to explain. And, um, but it, it just, it's so much to think about, like looking back about how, dysfunctional how crazy of a life how following him how digging how you know yeah. like it doesn't seem like normal to me people were like oh, i'm so sorry and whatever and i'm just like it's just another day honestly yeah weird yeah and th that does cut that makes sense too right because everyone everyone else looking in it's like it's it's the end of the story for them um yeah. and for you that's like the end of that part of your your life yeah right yeah so, it's it's strange and um i learned to um like just i i was determined to move forward and have a good life and change break that chain of welfare chain of um dysfunction or or alcoholism that sort of thing um but i will tell you he went to court and that was the best time um Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, no, we lost video maybe. though. Uh oh, I think we oh, might have no. had a. <laughs> Hopefully, the phone didn't die. She said she was putting on her battery saver mode. I heard that. Um, so we do. Um, well, there's a there's. Hopefully, she gets back soon because there's a lot I'm of comments up here now about James Hicks. I believe he was. Uh, found guilty of all those crimes because he uh, he told them where the bodies were just so he wouldn't have to uh, stay in Texas. He wanted to be extradited to Maine. Um, yeah, is he uh, uh, is he still he alive is, too? That was he is still alive, rotting. How, how long did the uh, was his what was his sentence for? Do you have any idea? Did I'm that? Looking, I'm looking it up now. That's... Yeah. And that saying she will be back. I'm, uh, I'm assuming that's someone close. <laughs> that's, oh man, what a roller coaster that must have been to, to have to live through. You know, and and I knew Tammy for a couple of years before I even knew about you know who her mom was and uh, her story, and you would never guess. Like Tammy's the nicest woman funny uh, what what year was that that he actually reason. so that must have been just about 2000 right that uh that he actually like confessed everything are you looking that up now yeah i'm looking the hell up i can i apologize because usually I, I know all these things like the back of my hand and then uh with this one yeah Rand Randa saying 2000 I believe as well yeah it's the yeah I can't imagine that that poor wonderful old lady who like getting put through all that entire situation and still having the you know the fortitude to to pay attention and writing out the note of like just a way so that people would know that it probably wasn't her that wrote it and then listening for where he was, knowing where he was and, you know, exactly. being brave enough to actually unlock that door and get away. Cause there's, there's a lot of people that don't, don't have that in them that probably would not have made through, made it through that. You have to wonder what, what his goal was. Right. Right. You know, this, 
it's just weird um i guess a lot of serial killers have the same uh mo right they do the same things it's like repeating themselves over and over again i'll give a shout out to uh kristen cv she does murder she told podcast uh she did a two-part series on this um james hicks and uh i believe she actually talked to tammy on that podcast as well um it's very informative kind of gives you more details on what we're covering tonight it's i think it's like two hours long but uh, check that out if you can murder Hold. and kristen's from newport as well so she's right from the same area where this all happened All right, we'll give it a few more minutes here to see if Tammy's able to jump back on. Apologize. Yeah, I'm assuming she either lost internet or lost power to her device. And she was really getting to a good part, too, because she was saying, like, the trial, the best part, and <laughs> she cuts out. That's, that's something that stuck with me over the years is uh, how strong she was during the trial, and she actually covered the victim statement uh, to James Hicks, and well, hopefully she's jumped back, uh, gets back on here and is able to tell you guys herself. So this is the Gateway Lounge where her mom disappeared from. This is actually Tammy in this picture. Oh, okay. So that was a few years ago. That's her mom. Then she said that that was a photo that she didn't think her kids had seen, right? Yes. Justice for Rob Morrison Jewers. I just pulled him up and he did get life. Sent us 12 for 2000. Thank you. Good piece of shit. Part of my language, but fuck him. Jennifer Wright. I need to get back on here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if she's messaged me. I know it was so, it was, it was like, oh, here, here we uh -oh. go. Oh, oh. Hey, okay. We got oh her my back. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, it that's fine. Black, that's fine. And I thought it was the battery, but it, it I don't know, it wasn't. It was still on fifteen percent. But anyways, are we still live and everything? No, yes, yeah. yes, we are. And you you were so just sorry. saying that you're talking about it, when you cut out, you were talking about uh like the best part, something along those lines was like during the trial. Oh, um Yeah. So we went to um you know, he was um charged with uh murder, two murders, because he had already been charged and done his time for Jenny. So he couldn't mm -hmm. be charged again. So I had a chance to see him face to face and write a um, victim statement. And it was like six pages long. And what I did and call me petty, whatever, I knew by this time what would get under his skin. And I did that. Um, so I got to read that and he had to sit there and listen to it. And I also brought up um, Jenny's sister because she wasn't allowed to ever give a statement um, to him. And they wouldn't allow her at this one as well, this court hearing or sentencing, because it didn't have anything to do with Jenny. So um, I had her stand with me at the podium. And I looked directly at him while I read it. And everything in it was intentional to get under his skin and for him to think because i knew that he was a narcissist he was that type of person that it would get to him so yeah. uh, i read it and he was so mad and i remember my last words to him were these 18 years have been a, a roller coaster ride for me today the roller coaster stops i get off and i leave you behind and he was so mad he told um, his lawyer, oh, things she said are not true. I need to say something. I need to be able to talk. And he said, no, you need to just not talk. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, so as he was leaving, um, he got two life sentences um, for the murder of my mother and the murder of Lynn Willette. And Maine, of course, has no death penalty and there's no chance of parole in Maine. And so he's still alive. He's still in prison. Um, and as he was walking out of the courtroom, he said to detective Zamboni, he said, um, if you ever let me out, I will kill her. He's never getting out. He's never getting out. No. And you know, he's treated in behind bars 
the, you get treated pretty much behind um, bars the way you act behind bars. So if you're mm -hmm. not a problem, you're treated pretty well, you know, for the most part. And um, so my um, someone I knew worked at the corrections, actually an ex-husband worked at, as a corrections officer at the prison. And at first I started asking every day, what is he doing? What is he doing? What's he like? What's, you know, and I had to stop. And he did say, all he has in his um, cell is a picture of the Tasmanian devil. That's it. Nothing else. No, t no TV, no nothing. Um, yeah. And he's very, he's very quiet. Um, he's in his 70s now. And um, nobody, I don't believe anybody visits him. He wanted to come to Maine so that his family would visit him. And I don't believe any of them visited him. I actually worked with his sister when I worked at Ames Department Store when I was, you know, 15 years old. Um, wow. Through, know, quite a while. Yeah. So, and we talked and stuff, but she believed him that he didn't do it. You know, most of his family believed him, but, um, but yeah. it, it is kind of a hard thing to, to try and think of a, a loved one that way. I mean, without a doubt. Oh, absolutely. But... I do agree. And that's why I never have once treated his family members poorly. That is right. not their fault. And I guess the last part is people don't understand. Some people can't understand why I actually have some empathy for him. You probably won't either, but, um, mm. he had a really bad childhood, um, and doesn't excuse what he did. Um, but the things that his mother did to him and forced him to do were unspeakable. Um, but there are a lot of people that that happens to, and they don't kill people. Exactly. Yeah. So, there's, but there's I do, plenty of that's me. I have some empathy. For yeah, that you, um, part of him. You were pen pals with him for a while, I think you told me at one point, right? No, I was pen pals with another um, person that like killed a shop um, person that caught shoplifters. Uh, so that's a whole other story. That's probably where you got that <laughs> from. But, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Told you. Um, told you we're, we're getting older. <laughs> yeah. And um, I've always thought about sending him a card. You should. But, you know. You but then get, it's like. Get, get well soon card. Yeah. Or, you know, how's it going? You know, and and how's your day? I don't know, but it, so, you know he's he's there still. Randa, Randa has a question for you. If you sure. could speak to him again in prison, would you? Would I speak to him? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I'd love to sit down across the table from him. Absolutely, and I would ask him why, like. Why? What What did you get from all of that? What led you to strangle? He said that every one of the women turned their backs to him. Like his wife um, was leaving him. And every time he strangled somebody, they had turned their back to the literally turned their back to him. And he was so full of himself that he it, just, you have to be. I mean, that like, that's 100 percent. Just oh, he thought he was right? a ladies man. Yeah, he thought right. he was a lady. How, how dare and, how dare you turn your back to yeah. me? You don't like I deserve I deserve your attention. So if you're mm -hmm. not gonna give it to me, I'm gonna kill you. It's Yes. It's and people disgusting. don't they wonder why he didn't why he killed my mother because he didn't date her. The other two he dated. And there is there's um things that came out that happened when he visited the home that night and I saw him standing over my bed. Um I think they fought and they left and fought. And that's probably most likely the reason so, he killed her. So you think that so, he was trying to do something to you and she kind of caught him yeah. or something, right? So I went under hip, I was put under hypnosis um, because I kept saying there was a man over my bed. There was a man over my bed and um, it came out in that hypnosis that that's what had happened. She came in. Um, they fought and um, they left and went to the lake. And that's where it happened. So, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I guess for a while, sometimes I thought it was my fault or because I said, I hope you die. Um, but I had to work through all that anger. I had anger for her for a long time. And it really... Um, a lot of it, the alcoholism and stuff, destroyed 
good part of my life. I didn't have a childhood. I left home at, um, I think by 12, 13 years old, I had left home. I, I was couch surfing um, and found some good people that gave me guidance. And wow. when I, yeah, when I was 15, um, complete strangers let me move in. Um, my best friend's family let me stay there and couch surf early, you know, when I was 13 and 14 and in school. And I ended up graduating when I was 17. And um, so, yeah, that's how so, that went. The, the, yeah, we have a comment here. Uh, Amy Tardy says, "Tammy, you've persevered through so much in your life, and it's remarkable how you how far you've come. the The strength you've shown is amazing, and you're a great mo role model for our children." Thanks. So, and yeah. and I just have to say, I've, I've seen a lot of these comments. There's like a ton of them. One of the strongest women I know. Um, you know, just a ton of comments like that, and I can see it. Like before, like I didn't know anything about this story or what you had been through. But after hearing all of this, it really is amazing. Like it's and it's really good to finally hear like the end of a story because quite often, you know, we talk about cold cases yeah. and people don't get the um the you know the resolve or, or whatever. There's no resolution um for most of these right. people. So it, it's good to hear this. Un it's unfortunate, obviously, but it's you've you've done I a lot. Thank you. I, I am glad that um, for the closure and I try to encourage people that I see have missing family members um, to don't, don't lose hope, you know, and it can happen. And um, this is a perfect example of it, it happening. And I, but that pain of never knowing I, I can't terrible. For people. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. I would like to get a chance to go through some of these some of these comments. Also, people, if uh, people who are listening, if this is your first time seeing us, if you uh, you know like sort of how this is uh, like what we're doing here, if you give us a follow or subscribe on YouTube or whatnot, we would greatly appreciate that. Absolutely helps us get these stories out. Um, Definitely. So uh, Matt Tully says Rhonda, she is an amazing woman and friend. Um, I'll try and get through some of these questions. So they've been piling up and it was hard oh, to, sure. sorry that we didn't, we didn't get to these earlier, but this, like you okay. did a very good job explaining, uh, giving us the, the full story here. So we didn't want to interrupt that. Um, sure. Heidi, uh, proud of you, Tammy. You are the strongest woman. I know you've uh, all you've been through and you've <clears throat> not let it get you, uh, make you bitter. You always let your light shine and set the best example for others. Um, Jennifer uh, King says, proud of you, friend. Uh, another one, uh, Wendy Renee Pooler Dougal. <laughs> Tammy is one of the strongest women I know more and more, and I can definitely see uh, where that's coming from. Um, I don't know if we did this one. Uh, this must have been from earlier. I second this. She is an amazing role model for her children and grandchildren, and not only has broken the cycle, but has used what she has been through to guide her children and grandchildren through her their own trials and tribulation she's such a special person there's a lot of love for you Thanks. um i have a lot uh, of good people in my life yeah and yeah it's it's very obvious did um, you see uh cj's question it says do you CJ? think the name lynn do you think the name lynn is a trigger for him Good you know, question. Do you know what his mom's name is? Ray. Ray Lynn. Ray Lynn? Cut it out. Yep. No way. Ray Lynn. Yeah, because I looked in the I um pulled out the book that was written today. Well, I pulled it up online and I was looking through it and um because of dates and stuff like that. And and he talked about his mom, Ray Lynn. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. wow. I'd never, ever that ever thought about that jenny Lynn, wow, good yeah Lynn. good job cj that that was Who's a CJ? good good pickup yes this this is cj jefferson norvell oh yes yes we're that's, related that's yeah. crazy yeah that's true never thought of that interesting um and chris carney we love you tammy Peace. i think they must have added you there um yep and Sarah Tully, she's an amazing woman. Love you, Tammy. Um, 
Yeah, that. Holy. I never even yeah. had thought of that. So yeah, they. Interesting. My mom, uh, you know, a lot of people that knew my mother um, always said she was always a good person um, and a good friend. Um, and again, I've had to, I, I've come to peace with that. That I don't think she did it to be. I think she just made some really bad decisions and choices to find love in the bottle and in men, if that makes sense. Like, yeah. Well, how old um, was your mom when, when she, when she passed away? I want to say 37. Something okay. like that. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you, it, and you also like, have to think, Oh, sorry. No, you're good. Go ahead. Uh, you also have to think that, um, one of the last acts your mom may have done is to try to protect you, right? Oh, oh, <laughs> you still there? There we go. Yep. Um, you have to think that maybe one of the last things your mom did is try to protect you, right? So mm-hmm. ultimately, she yeah. was. A good yeah. Mom. It. Um. It. It just. It. I would. I would like to think that absolutely. You know, that's what she was doing. Um. And. You know, I would, what I do, I wish that I would know, know now how she would be, um, to be around my kids, my grandkids, like, would she have gotten sober? Would she have, I would like to know the person that she would be. So I, I've missed out on all of that. And I've always been open with my kids about everything I, I experienced and they've always been supportive. And it's like, I think they look at me like, wow that's crazy but yeah you 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 learn and you can either follow the um the cycle that you've grown up in or you can break that cycle and my two brothers have also um i would say broken the majority of the cycle but addiction runs high in our family alcoholism and um unfortunately you get sucked into that and it's hard to get out and that's how you cope you self-medicate and you'll ask anyone alcohol is not my thing um i don't like it um so yeah i didn't get that gene i guess i got my dad's gene who never drank a drop of alcohol in his life isn't that strange yeah (laughs) yeah Um, i don't know yeah yeah another another comment here from lisa both your dumpy uh Tammy is an awesome person. And another comment from Carrie Bickford, street smarts can't be taught out of a book. Tammy is smarter than most I know with an eight year education with experience in their field. And so, so, so many have benefited, benefited from her life experiences. Are you, um, have you helped others? Is that what she's alluding to? Yeah. Yeah. I get put in some strange situations. Uh, My family, (laughs) Nothing surprises them anymore. And Carrie, Carrie, right now, yes, I'm actually working on something right now that has recently happened. And um, there was a young woman uh, murdered in Fairfield. And I kind of, her parents called from South Carolina. It was the Luke Teeman case, Valerie Teeman. Yes, yes. I was going to actually bring that up. Thank you. Yeah. So I kind of knew how they felt. Their daughter was missing. They're far away. Um and I called my friend in the state police when I was working at that protection in Walmart because they had called the Walmart security desk to look at videos. And he came in and he said, if you're calling me, I know there's something. She'd been missing a couple of weeks. He went to Fairfield PD and within 24 hours, they took over the case. Um, and I drove that night. I didn't even know these people. Drove to the home where she was living with her husband and his family in Fairfield. Uh, my husband followed along, just shaking his head. And so did my son and said, okay. And I took all of her belongings out of that house because they were afraid they would, these people would destroy her belongings, put them in our house. And for like nine months, we didn't even have Christmas that year because we had no room. And we, I went through all, I sat many nights, going through her belongings for her family, reading her writings. Finally, within about a week, 
after the state police took over, they found her body. Yeah. And he had killed her. And I just knew something was wrong. I get these feelings. My, I know my kids and my husband are sitting there watching going, you, you guys just don't know. You have no idea. <laughs> you don't know what she is capable of. She oh. used to stalk a serial killer. Yeah, nothing surprises them anymore. Um, I, I remember when you did all that, too. You are telling me about it, too. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty amazing. It's, um, and my husband and I packed the items into a Penske truck, and we drove them to her family and met her family. And to this day, I'm not sure if they're on here watching right now. Um, yeah, they're still in our life. So it's amazing. Um, yeah, it's so, so it's so awesome to see like like all for with, for everything that you've been through. You you turned it into like you turned it into the experience for helping other people. You know, you, all everything that you've experienced, and and like you said, rather than turning to like you know wallowing and and mm-hmm. and hurting from it and I, I don't doubt that you do hurt and you have your moments for sure but it, it's sure. very obvious that you're you're taking all of this and using yep. what you know for for really good things and it's it's amazing mm-hmm. to see and i think that was part of my healing i oh. i do heal for, through that um by do helping oh heidi her toe yeah, she comment. said, I, I th- yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, Tammy, when you commented, you live what you have experienced. She, she lived uh, what she knew. If she had other opportunities or experience, she surely would have made different choices for and certainly you had the strength to break it and so much better uh, and do so much better. Yeah. Can you, I have you so many good people in my question? life. He had asked this <laughs> earlier too. Uh, the kids that were taken away, anyone know what went to them? So I'm guessing um, it's James Hicks children yeah so his kids um the ones that were taken away uh in tech or before he left for texas with uh brandy um i read that she did get two of her children back um one i think was adopted out um but she did get two of them back to this day i'm not sure if um you know she she has them or if they're grown or or what but her his children were abused by him um physically sexually and i get their pain i i understand it um i just hope that they've gone on to live a better life and to heal from it to carry that embarrassment i'm sure and the fact that your father killed three women it's got to be a lot to carry Absolutely. And like, um, like you're talking about with like alcoholism, like they're probably worried it runs in their genes as well, you know? Yeah. Oh, right. absolutely. Yeah. What is Garrison? And uh, Garrison said, if Nancy Drew and Sherlock Holmes had a child, meet my mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, your your daughter had enough. said she has power, so everything always follows her, she says. Oh, it does. <laughs> and and it's just like, even right now, I'm working on something and um, to help someone that just recently had um, something tragedy and um, hoping, trying to research and, and uncover some things and help them. Well, and yeah, you, I, I mean, think, you're, you're messaging me about uh, Alex Jackson's case. Yeah, you know, <laughs> something is just one. pushing me with that one. Oh, I can't stop thinking about it. And I just keep going back to it. So. Yeah, and I probably, I don't know, should be in some line of work of that, but it is what it is. It finds me anyways. I agree. Right. Well, remember, might, as well, might, as, might as well get paid for it, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you did, my, uh, my family just accepts it at this point. They don't even question it. I so. remember one thing about you I always remember is when you did asset protection, you know, you'd catch these yeah. teenage girls stealing makeup or whatever it was, and you'd know, like the care you took with them, and you try to figure out why they're doing it, and kind of yeah. without telling them your story but kind of say hey i know how this turns out like this is not the path yeah. to go down i always yeah. really uh i forget the yeah what i'm trying to say but yeah you're always good with I, I know what you're saying because we have um a, a group of kids i don't know if we're running out of time or not but um, oh no we, we have, have no a, time limit it, okay so we have a um been having a problem in fairfield for the last few years with some juveniles that are just out of control 
and my kids are grown. I don't have any kids in the school system. I don't have any grandkids in that town. And I got, I got mixed up in that. And I mean, I'm glad to have helped in Jennifer King on here and Buffy Clifford and Wendy um, Dougal. We all have worked on hard on that and trying to get it under control because people are feeling threatened and afraid and you should never be afraid to be in your community and walk in your community. And that was terrible. And so we worked on that. And where I'm going with this is these kids would say terrible things um, to me, to some of these other ladies when they saw us or whatever. Well, I was walking one night with my dog and I came upon them and they started videotaping me and it was dusk and I don't care who you are. I will still call you out. And I said, what are you doing? And the big tough one that was the leader of the gang um, he's like, oh, you messed with us all last summer. I said, you earned all that, buddy. And so we met up down at the Cumberland Farms, and I he was running his mouth, and I got nose to nose to him. And I said, if you're going to talk shit about me, you better look me in the eye and talk shit about me. And he just kind of was like, and then I said, you know what? I bet you don't think I understand what you're going through at home. I said, maybe not the exact same things, but listen, listen to this. And I just told him a little bit and the look in his eyes was like, what? And one of the other punks that was there, sorry, <laughs> said, um, oh, he started running their mouth about me. And he said, shut up. She's talking. And he reached out to me. This was, went on for like a year or more that, you know, they had been harassing everybody. And he reached out to me privately after that. And he said, I just want to tell you, I'm really sorry for what I said to you and what I've done to this community. And I said, buddy, you want to change your ways? I'll be your biggest supporter. And, but he, you know, I, I think he wants to, but he's stuck right now. And, but that just goes back to, you know, when people think that you don't understand, they don't know people's background and what people have been through. So mm -hmm. don't judge a book by its cover. And um, so he had no idea. He just thought I was, you know, I had the perfect life. I had this, I had that but I can relate to you, you know, I can relate to what you're going through and making why you're making some of these choices. I made a lot of choices in my life. I wish I could go back and change. And um, some of the survival skills I, I learned throughout the years, everybody's like, you're so strong, you're so strong. But what they don't realize is, yeah, I'm, I'm strong and I, I did survive, but some of those survival skills aren't good ones. Travis will not, Travis knows what I'm talking about. And you, and um, so you have to, uh, make a decision at some point to change and um, let those survival skills go so you can have a better life. And it's a lot of therapy sometimes. <laughs> you, have to have a sense of, you have to have a sense of humor too. Right, and, um, right. you know, it is what it is. I mean, I kept my mother's shoes that she was found in. You really have to have a sense of humor because you can't just be dark all the time. And what I, she was wearing a pair of shoes and the lucky penny obviously wasn't friggin' lucky, but whatever. I still have that. And her shoes were Dexter's shoes. And I was like, those things were in pristine condition after all that time of being buried. I mean, come on. They so you're could a big use supporter of Dexter's shoes. I, I was like, Holy moly. That is, a, that's incredible. So again, you gotta have some sense of humor with the, with everything, you know, and can't be serious all the time, and try to do the right thing and be a good person and help people. So. That. Oh man, yeah. that's. Um, <laughs> oh, where'd that go? We we did have a, another comment from Darcy Smith. The world definitely Darcy. needs more people like her in it. Uh, I've said this many times over the years, and I I hundred percent agree. We like, make a, a superhero comic book about you. <laughs> um what what yeah. did he get for a sentence? I think I missed that. He got two two life sentences. We did go over that yeah. already. Yeah. Um and Wendy said keep telling me we need to open our own private investigation business. Yeah. I think you'd probably oh, do, do pretty well. Yeah. Um yeah. Oh, God. Danielle, it's Travis's wife, says I seriously love this and I'm I'm loving this too. Um Yeah. yeah. Let's see another I, comment from Jen Jennifer King. Uh, the punks <laughs> surely had an eye opener for us ladies. We aren't done yet. Yep, um, she's right about Jasmine that. Said, she's, yep. Jasmine right. says, proud of you, Tammy. Thanks, Jeff. 
but uh yeah it's it's crazy oh. and see friends comment what's that see Fern's oh, no. comment uh Fern. Oh, Fern Dawson it, says I dated him and took care of his kids. Yeah, uh, she did in, the in trailer TNT park. Trailer Park. Okay. Yep. Yes, she did. It was in Levant, was it? Um, uh, I think but, she said in Carmel. Carmel. Yep. Actually, I read her. Was looking through the book today, and her name was in there. And um, and uh, yeah, she's lucky she made it out alive. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Well, she didn't have Lynn as her name, right? So Yeah, that's so, craziness. That is that is really that is really nuts. bizarre. I I'm, I'm surprised be... that no one's picked up on that before. Like, but that's yeah. a really good spot. It was a CJ that said that, right? Yeah. Um Yeah, Fern, I could have been the next. No, abs absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and his um Linda Marquis that he married, um I did meet with her. My aunt and I met with her um privately and you know, when you don't know someone, you're thinking, oh, she's going to be a terrible woman. You know, she's living with a guy that's, you know, women have been come up missing. But people do things for different reasons. They stay for different reasons. And she was a nice woman. I mean, you know, you would think she, not knowing her, she would be evil of these women that lived with him. No, they were just as much victims of him. Yeah. They absolutely. had no part, no part in these murders none they have no responsibility in it so nor do his children no so. no yeah and it's yeah you it's very obvious that you have a lot of empathy and compassion for 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 people and all these for everything that you've been through it's it's still right there at the forefront so that's that's really good to see yeah so one day we'll get that uh, message that he's died and I'm not sure how that'll be. I've thought about that recently. So maybe that means... Let's have a party. Die soon. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It'll be weird. I don't know. So I would love well, to Yeah, to I mean, just yeah, just another closing chapter, right, for... Yeah, for absolutely. Crazy story. Yep. Someone asked if Fern's middle name was Lynn, and she said, no, it's Marie. So that's why she's a survivor. <laughs> Lucky for you, Fern. Yeah, definitely. And my middle name is Lynn. So. Oh, it is. Oh no doubt. Yeah, Cammy Lynn. And I, yeah, I was actually to say make comment like this. You know, hopefully he sees it's in prison. Do you think he'll see this podcast in prison? Maybe you could send it to prison and ask him to watch it. <laughs> yeah, like I'm sure they have access to computers. That would be awesome, or somebody to tell him about it. Huh. Hey, buddy, how's Please. it going? I wonder. I wonder yeah. if he does do that. Like, they probably do have some sort of internet. Well, no, maybe not. Maybe not. Well, yeah, they, they've they've updated a few things recently. They they can do quite a bit in prisons and, maybe, and jails now. Maybe somebody that works there will see it. Or, yeah, does a know, guard or it. someone? Yeah. Well, so my ex husband who worked there at the time did have an interaction with him, and uh, uh, Jimmy was sick or something, and. And he wanted to go back into his cell. So um, this person went to let him in. And, you know, he's, he used to be treated nice. And, and my ex-husband slammed the door behind him. And he's like, well, what was that for? You know, and he, because he goes, I, I feel like shit. If my ex-husband said, you're a piece of shit. And <laughs> walked off. And he's like, well, why? Why do you say that? You know, yeah, but, maybe because you murdered several yeah. people. Oh, yeah. man. I bet he doesn't. The narcissism it, still shines through, apparently. Yeah, I, I would like to know where his family, his kids are, especially his daughter Veronica. That's who I went to school with, and know what her life is like right now. You know, and I hope it's good and and, and stuff. So I don't know. I could find her, I'm sure. <laughs> so, but who knows? So, well, I I don't know if you uh, if you ever have a reason to make it north but if you ever get through solon and you stop at the solon hotel and you want a meal it's covered on me that's where i work so what if you, ever, if you make it through you, yeah that's where my mother always went really really yeah no doubt. the solon hotel so my ex-husband my first husband my garrison Aranda's dad played there last weekend um, with 
the uh, Six Ways of Sunday Automatics. Yes. Okay. I didn't yes. actually get okay. to see them. I heard they were, I, yes. I heard that the lead singer is, is amazing, though. Yes, she is. So he's the drummer, and he's actually amazing. Um, he, oh, we're, we're still, we're, oh, we're great friends. We all go camping together and everything. So yeah. Yeah. When my daughter was just up there um, with a bunch of people listening, and I said, Oh, oh no kidding. Maybe you see my mother's ghost up there. Those yeah, she said, uh, Randa just said yes. I was there at the Soho. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no kidding. I, I was. I, I yeah. No kidding. That yeah, is awesome. Yeah, I, I was. I wasn't there that night. I, I usually work yeah. the days where I, I bounce on nights where it's it's busy. Uh, I'm a bartender yeah. and bouncer up there. Oh, um, how fun! Yeah, but uh, like, but offer still stands. If you want to come up sometime yeah. and, and and get a meal, I'll I'll, I'll cover it for Definitely. you. Definitely, I would. I would love to meet you. Will, and, will you buy mine uh, too? No, Travis. No, I see you all the time. <laughs> yeah, but I you guys Jeff do great. Work. Yeah, I want to say you guys do great work as well. Um, um, bringing these missing people, um, you know, their stories out and letting their families talk, or and you never know what it will trigger in someone. Like, oh man, I saw this, or or maybe this is important. It's just the little things that can solve a case, and um you guys bringing all these cases you know to light mine is um solved but there's so many missing people out there and um, just, so it's great work that you guys do it's crazy well, thank it's like, you very much yeah it, it's yeah. been a while since we worked together but i remember talking to you about these cases and you know like ayla's case that all happened and oh, how, yeah. how touched i was by that that you and i spoke about it yeah. so it's, it's cool like it's, it's like a full circle now so it's cool yeah yeah, well, you and I have a lot of the same thoughts on different things and and why people do the things they do or or these crimes that have taken place. And, um, yeah, so it's interesting stuff. Um, yeah. I love to um, investigate and um, stuff like that. So I figure things out, help people. Um, I'd rather take their pain on most times than, than them keep it. It's funny because I think survivors feel like I've survived this, so I can take any amount of pain, but you feel like others can't survive it, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm, you want right. to take their pain away like, and help them. You've been through you know? it, so you know you can get through it, so you yeah. want to, try to take this. Yeah. But Randa says, says, uh, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Randa says, what thank you? you for having my mom on here to share a story. She has not spoken a ton publicly about this, but I'm glad, I'm so glad she has. You guys are awesome definitely part of the healing process i will tell you that definitely so i appreciate that yeah and travis reached out what the day after my mother's birthday yeah yeah it we was. talked about that too it's like that's crazy yep. too uh, we weird. were supposed to talk to somebody else tonight and then they weren't able to make it and like oh you know what tim and i always want to try to do this so yeah uh, thank yep. you so much for such short yeah. notice uh, i think it was yeah, sunday right when I, I reached out to you yeah, and I told him, I said, you know, just reach out, um, you know, and I'll be there. So, very much appreciate it. Um, and thanks, everyone, for oh. being so kind to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, everyone's been great. And Fern. Yeah, yeah uh, that's awesome. I hope Fern's doing well. I don't know her, but I've, I mean, I've, I've heard of her in, in the story and stuff, so... Uh, Fern's yep. also saying her her niece was Tina Stadig, who's missing from uh, Skowhegan. Yeah. We actually we actually did a, a march for her with. Uh, I'm not sure if you were there, but some of her family was there for that. We we marched yeah. through Skowhegan. Uh, and I had and talked to was happening. I had talked to his yeah. mom a couple of different times about coming on the show and talking about her case. Um, yeah. But I think I think she will be uh, on here soon, uh, maybe okay. with with her sisters. Yeah. Wasn't she tied to they have a suspect or they think they do? Is that yes. the one? Yeah. Yeah. So oh, Wendy. It, it was a, go ahead. Wendy. Oh. Wendy says, What a great podcast. Thank you for having this wonderful woman on and have her story uh, tell a story. Thank oh, you. We're Wendy. Very lucky for, for her to join yep. us tonight. Yep. yep. So well, I'll keep watching definitely and, and I hope um, people will start to subscribe to you or uh, follow you and um, they'll learn a lot and maybe they'll help solve the cases. Yeah. So, 
Yep. Hey, Garrison. Garrison, do you remember meeting me? I met you at uh, Central Maine Motors. <laughs> we were both get, Every, getting vehicles. I was buying a vehicle. Garrison. Yeah, I think I was buying a vehicle and maybe he was buying one or he was having work done. I don't remember, but somehow him and I just started talking. Oh, Tammy, mom. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so it's funny really because just... Garrett... Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, so he, Garrison was probably when, I remember when they said that um, it was going to be on the news and, or Hicks was going to come back and, and disclose where the body, you know, the remains were. Well, the media, of course, like started camping outside our house and to try to get an interview. And I remember the day I granted an interview to, I think it was Grover, Alan Grover, maybe. I think it was, he was for channel five news or something. Anyways, they were coming to the house and Garrison, I remember him coming down over the stairs. He was probably, so that was in 2000. He was probably seven or eight. And he comes down over the stairs with his, little dress shirt and dress pants and a tie on and all ready for his interview. I'm like, so I remember that. And, uh, yeah, that was a hard time because some people didn't know. And then we'd get the media camping out and that was just, you know, so, and then, um, at the courthouse and, and things like that. So that, that gets hard. And I can understand how it's hard for some family members that are in the you know spotlight. Like my case wasn't even as, big or whatever and they are chased by media that's hard you know and sometimes people forget that they're humans and human and they have feelings and they need some space so yep but i remember that garrison and oh oh where's that going trying to do the same when i am no no i didn't click it just disappeared anyways uh heidi yeah, um, <clears> says there's spoken, an older oh. i've spoken to her brother francis Oh, sorry. Good. This, this I was just going to read the good. comment. Yeah, oh, there's sure. a yeah, there's an older but very interesting case of a young mother from Rustic County that you could cover. Uh, her last name is uh, Pictu, I believe. Pictu. I don't know how that spells. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Um, and I've spoken to her brother Francis before, about a year and a half ago, about possibly coming on the podcast, but we weren't able to make things work. But I do want to cover that story. Um, and. She's Native American as well, so I think a lot of times women they get, of, mm -hmm. of that descent seem to get the shaft on things. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and the the murder Heidi, rate is like fifty percent higher than any other population. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Um, that's okay, Heidi Herto that just made that comment. It's interesting. So when I worked started with Ames Department Store for the Asset Protection. Her husband, George, um, worked for um, my husband and I in, in asset protection. He used to be a police officer, I think in Massachusetts. So, um, you know, he knows all, all about the story. And um, so if she's, they know a lot of the people up in the county and, and things like that. They're good people. And yeah, yeah. so it's nice funny how it all that... comes around yeah, I used to work with a guy that uh, knows the story well. He's from that area. He knows the family and everything. Virginia. Yeah, yes. I don't, I don't know the story, so I'll have to go read about it. I try to keep up on the missing people and um, what's going on with the cases and stuff like that. Sad. There's quite a few. There's too many. It's a good place um, to uh, keep up on them is on locating the lost. Follow us on Facebook. And all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, so. That, Go ahead. <laughs> Jennifer Lynn King says, "Let's find Shirley Moon now." Uh, hopefully, Jennifer, we did do we did cover uh, the Shirley Moon Atwood case on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know the the woman that he killed, um, the Borley. I think he killed Borley, right? The, he was convicted of that one. Who are we talking um, about now? I'm sorry. She, um, At Atwood. Um, oh, the, Shannon Atwood. Yeah, he. Wasn't he convicted for the Gorley case? Was that her name? No, I think I went to no. school with. Come on, Jeff. Yeah, Pull it was... out, Jeff. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, he was. Um, Cheryl. No, Cheryl. Cheryl. He was yes, convicted Cheryl. for killing Cheryl. Yes. Oh right. So, yes. Yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he was convicted of killing her. I knew her. Um, and 
through, we went to school together and then I ended up setting up some transportation for her when I worked for a transportation company. Um, so he, he, he recently passed away though, right? In prison. Yes. Yes. And actually there's a comment he here about that away. too. Sarah, yeah. Sarah says, I worked sure. with a woman who, who has never been found it, but her husband was convicted of killing his girlfriend. He just died in prison. Shannon Atwood was her yeah. husband and her name was Shirley Moon Atwood. Yep. yep. How sad yep. for her family. Yep. And Cheryl Murdoch, right? right. Yep. Yes. Yes. I think, yeah, Cheryl I think, yes. That's yes. it. I don't know why I thought Gorley. Cheryl Murdoch. No, it was Sharon yep. and Shirley and Sh Sh yeah, just I remember it being very confusing trying to keep up with the yes names. He reminds me of Hicks. Absolutely. Like the the funny thing is my last name is Atwood and I I live like well, I live in Seoul and I'm relatively close to, to mm -hmm. where that all happened. I was concerned. He actually kind of looks a little bit like me. I was concerned I might I have been related say, yes. somehow. Oh, really? You might be. Yeah. Um, I lived in Seoul with my mother for a while. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. No kidding. Yep. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's this. She was dating uh, a man there. Not a nice man. Hayden was the last name. So, um, yeah. We lived in a lot of places. So, one school year, it was like five different schools I went to. Oh, wow. So, wow. Yeah. We would get in the back. I remember several times being in the back of the tr a truck in the middle of the night with our belongings and riding in the back of the truck. And because um, we were, you know, the rent was due. So. Wow. But anyways. Yeah. Yep. So. Um, and my. Um, it affected. um all of us and my relative, my brother who was raised as my cousin actually never got over the fact that he was, uh, my mother gave him to her sister. He ended up dying, um, suicide by police. Oh, mechanic. oh. yeah. Yeah. So that haunted him for a long time. Did he know like his whole life or did he find out later on in life? No, I think he knew most of his life. And it's not like she, you know, he was the last child and she just couldn't take care of another child. She, he was either, I think he was just before Tom, uh, my, I think there's my older brother. And then I think Chris was the next one. And then my other brother and then me, or he was in between anyways. And so he just never understood, you know, it haunted him, I think, till wonder why 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 yeah. was i given up uh again my mother tough. my mother um didn't want to give him away and was pretty much forced talked into it by her family so sad sad for sure it affected um affected many people's lives and i don't think parents understand sometimes i'm far from perfect um but a lot of parents don't understand their actions, how it affects their children, and for a long time, the things that they do um, or don't do. And um, so, yeah, a lot of mental health issues for people. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, well, I think so. people are so selfish yeah. nowadays too. Like, oh my I mean, gosh! Yep, I guess I it depends agree. on the person, but we're all I so agree. busy and caught up with our own lives that. The kids kind of get yep. left behind, and I agree, I agree. So, but so, oh, well, Tammy, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I think I was about to say up. the same thing roughly. You were, yeah, I was, I think we're probably close to finishing up. If anyone had any more, uh, any more questions that they wanted to get in before we, we finish up, we'll give you, give you another minute or so to get those in. But, um, Sarah said, Shirley was such a kind soul. I miss her and think for all the time. I'm so sorry, oh. Sarah. Sad. Sad. Um, you should start your own podcast. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you know how much I've got going on? I have eight grandkids. <laughs> oh. could be eight Grandma grandkids. Detective. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Grandma Detective. Um, yeah. It was funny. I showed that picture, like, uh, of my mother to the grandkids and to my kids and they're just like it's weird because they just have really no idea no of who you know 
that you sent me when the um, when you brightened it up, and so it was it was kind of weird. It was a shock to me, like you said, but I appreciate that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, the animated photo. I'm yeah, sorry, I was reading Kirk's comment. Yeah. Oh God, that's my husband. Yeah. yeah. Oh, please no. Uh, yeah. To the yeah. podcast, I assume. Oh yeah. See, he like he just he yeah no that man he. He doesn't even, he just rolls with it and um, he doesn't even fight it anymore. So, <laughs> what conditioning he's, he's learned, right? <laughs> yes. And, and people will reach out and he's like, how do they know? How do they get a hold of you? How do they? Know? And it's like, I don't know. It just happens. But he's, I'm very, he's a I, silent supporter. Yes. <laughs> he, he is. He said to put up with a lot of stuff. I'll assure you. So craziness, but. He's a good man, so I'm lucky. Yep. My kids are all supportive, so I'm very lucky. But anyways, thank you guys so much for having me on. Yeah, and well, thank you very and, much for, for yeah, being with us. This is It's been fun. It's been, you know, tell the story, and there's a lot more to it. There's, you know, but that's the basics. And, um, yeah, glad he got caught. His own selfish reasons that he got caught, but... He got to come back to Maine, but... But, right, his, his narcissism bit him in the ass, unfortunately. It did. It did. So, yeah. Yeah. So, hope to meet you, you should... and I'm sure, Travis, I'll see you. What was you going to say? Oh, Matt said, can you tell us your YouTube channel name? And it should be just under Locating the Lost. Um, yeah. I don't think there's anything else. It might be no. Locating the Lost once. I don't remember. But... No, I think it's just Locating the Lost, but... Yeah. But, uh... Anyways, well, thank you everyone for for tuning in tonight. Yeah. Um, you've been very engaging, so it's a lot of really good questions. And and thank you again, Tammy, very much for yeah. for joining us. Yeah, um, yes. thank, thank you so you much. It's good seeing yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Good to see you. Have a good night, All guys. Right. All, All right. right. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Bye.